Hi, my name is Bradley Chambers. I am the director of IT at a private school in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, here I do everything related to technology from the fiber coming into the building to, to every single printer. Everything in technology in this building is mine. We have approximately 300 students. Um, I manage a network of 65 access points, 15 switches, firewall, uh, IP cameras, uh, network video recorder, a uh, couple hundred iPads, 50 or so Macs, um, all the cloud services that we use. Really, again, everything with technology, if, if it uh, gets on the network, it's under my control. So you know, I've really got to be a jack of all trades. And so I think um, um, it it's, can be difficult at times, but it's, it's also very rewarding. Um, and so I've been doing this for 11 years. And um, one of the things that I've always said to people that's very unique with technology is uh, you're never done with technology in terms of when you deploy something, uh, it becomes your project to maintain forever. So if we deploy iPads, um, yeah, deploy them, then I also have to maintain them and, and update them, install new apps, troubleshoot them. And so you really understand the full life cycle of, um, of technology. And, uh, you know, another thing that's really changed is that uh, over the past 10, 11 years, um, the technology world has, has changed. Everything I deal with today didn't exist when I started to work here, let alone when I was in college. No, I didn't go to college for uh, information technology. I went to college for business. But, um, you know, the, really, even if I'd gone to college for IT, uh, it wouldn't really do me a lot of good today because things have changed so much. And you think when I was in college back in the, the mid, uh, mid to early 2000s, um, you know, wireless was just coming on the market, uh, you know, up to 11 uh, A and B were the wireless standards. There was no smartphone, there was no iPad. Uh, the fact that laptops, you know, even had a Wi-Fi connection, even if it was 11 megabits per second was amazing. Uh, and, and then now we're sitting here with wireless connections that run in the you know, hundreds of hundreds of megabytes on, on actual throughput. Um, things have just changed. I mean, they've just changed. And so one of the key things I've always tried to pride myself on is continually learning. Um, you, you really, with IT and technology, you, you can't ever stop. And um, 2020 has certainly changed that, again, for a lot of uh, technology teams. You know, you, you have, there are a lot of assumptions we often made about uh, building security. It was security at the perimeter, security at the firewall level, uh, how you trust devices, how you trust the users. And, and one of the key things was um, everybody would largely be in the building. And uh, obviously now that's not the case. Uh, we, we live in an environment where... Uh, everybody is remote. You um, you don't just have one building to maintain. Uh, you you almost have to maintain every single employee's uh, home networking connection. So how you how you deal with that is is a challenge. Uh, and, and and how you do uh, troubleshooting, how you do device deployment, how you do repairs, all that has changed in a world where employees are working from home, and and you may not even. Uh, ever physically see the machine, ever physically meet the employee, but you are the person that has to support them. And and again, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, that can go wrong that aren't necessarily your fault, but they become your problem. I mean, what you don't want is for a VP of sales to be doing a Zoom webinar and their Wi-Fi kind of go out on them. Uh, again, not your fault, but it, it is your problem. So in this discussion today, we're going to be talking about supporting um, you know, in users in a, in a remote work world, particularly from an Apple, uh, Apple stance. So I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, some of the things we're going to be kind of working through is shadow IT versus remote IT. Uh, and if you don't know what shadow IT is, we'll, we'll cover that. We're going to be th talking about thinking through your new network and the new normal, as they say, what does device deployment look like in a remote work world? Um, enabling users to support themselves, remote app installation, remote access tools, operating system updates and the strategy there, particularly again when you don't see the device, device repairs, device offboarding, employee onboarding, and unfortunately deploy offboarding. So that's what we're gonna to cover today. Um, now, so if you have questions, obviously I'm not with you live, where I can only ask, answer questions, um, but you can certainly email me. Uh, one of the things I failed to mention is I do a write for the popular Apple website, 9to5mac.com. So if you um, have questions about anything we cover today, just, just send me an email. I'll do the best I can to help you out. My email address is bradley at 9to5mac.com. Uh, so let's get started. All right. 
So the first part of this presentation, we're going to watch shadow IT and remote IT. And there are differences. Uh, shadow IT is when the tools of an organization don't meet the needs uh, of the employees and, and they seek out their own solutions that are outside of the purview of the IT department. So a good example is, um, let's say your company's file sharing solution is clunky, it's hard to use, it's slow, hard to log into from offsite. So departments end up signing up for Dropbox for Teams accounts and just expensing it on a corporate credit card through their own budgets. Then IT has no idea where this data lives, has no access to it to control it, um, audit it, to keep making sure it's in compliance. This is shadow IT. And it's not a good thing. Um, number one, uh, the job of an IT department is to be in charge of the company's data, company security, and when departments find their own solutions, even ones that are above board legitimate solutions, they they may not fit in with the compliance goals and the security goals of the organization. That's that's IT job to do. Um, but on the flip side, IT also needs to have solutions in place that meet the needs of the employees. And, and so you really just can't, as an IT department, pick the solutions that work best for you uh, from a security perspective, from a deployment perspective, from a uh, maintenance perspective, you need to find the solutions that, that meet the needs of the organization as a whole. And that's meeting the needs of IT, but also the end users. It needs to be easy uh, to use, easy to kind of work with. Uh, it should, should be fast. It should just work. Um, so that's shadow IT. So no, no, remote IT is different, a different thing because you're, you're, good ha you're having to enable users to leverage company tools when you don't have directly access to the machine or them. So you could be, uh, you know, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I might have to support a user in Seattle, Washington um, on a network that I don't control, an internet provider I didn't pick and have no relationship with. It may be even uh, a Wi-Fi network I didn't set up or manage. Um, and, and if it's in a BYOD situation, maybe it's a machine that I don't even control or, or own or maintain. Um, and, and so that's really uh, something to consider with remote work is, you know, how you design solutions for in the office is going to be different with how you design solutions when the employees are remote. And so you really have to think through your strategy and your application strategy um, that, you know, how does it work? Uh, you know, does, does it require a VPN to connect? If so, why? Uh, is that VPN fast? If so do employees have access uh, to a fast enough internet to make that work? And if not, what are your solutions there? Because you can't just throw up your hands and say, sorry, your internet's not fast enough. People have to be able to do the work. So that made me rethinking, do we do we even need a VPN? How do we, what solutions do we put into place? Um, you know, one of the things that's a, a common discussion here is zero trust networking to where, um, you know, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, so much of our security for so long was built around securing the perimeter. Well, in a zero trust networking environment, everything is assumed to be insecure by default. And only after passing a checklist are devices and users deemed uh, secure uh, and able to access it. So the first part of this is device security, um, then user authentication, authentication or device authentication, then user authentication, and then it could be something as simple as uh, IP address check. So not that you're monitoring um, every single IP address, but you know if you know Sally in Florida is suddenly connecting in Europe uh, an hour later after she, she logged in in Florida. Well, that should that should cause concern. Where when that's something to where when majority of the users were in the office, you didn't have to think about. And, and so how you do remote IT does require a a complete rethinking for your organization. And so you, in some ways, if your company is going to be remote you have to start at the groundwork and say, okay, if we're designing our networking, um, and that could just be data center, all, all aspects of it, you, know, you may not even have near as much of a network to maintain. Um, what does our application stack look like? Um, what does our device deployment look like? There's a lot of things to consider with remote IT. So I think the first and most important thing to consider is starting over. And if you're in, your organization is going to be remote, then you're going to need to start over um, with that. So 
uh, again, the shadow IT versus remote IT. The shadow IT, again, is bad. That's when employees take their uh, kind of the, the IT uh, decisions in their own hands, which is not good. And IT needs to make decisions that makes employees not want to do that. Uh, and then you really have to rethink your information technology strategy uh, for a remote workforce. All right. So the next part of our discussion here is going to be talking about your new network. We kind of hinted on that uh, in the previous section. Um, when employees are at home, um, your security mindset um, is, is going to have to change. Um, again, we talked about zero trust networking. We talked about um, you know securing the perimeter no longer is a feasible security solution. Now, when you're designing for a remote-only organization, you may really have to think through, um, you know, do you manage an employee's network? Do you ask them to get a second internet connection that's dedicated just for uh, company work? Do you ship them enterprise networking gear? Tons of vendors have small routers um, that you can manage and monitor and push out uh, updates to. So that's really something you're going to want to think through. Um, you know, and one of the downsides is you're not always going to be able to control the internet speeds somebody can get. Um, but if you're paying for a dedicated connection, if you're managing the network, you at least could know that 100% of what was on that network is um, corporate only. So you wouldn't have you know, somebody's child watching Netflix during the day after virtual learning is over and messing up with a important Zoom call. Um, so it just gives you a level of, level of control. You can put in your own quality of service settings um, from, from there. So again, that's just something to think through um, as you're designing your remote, fir remote first workforce. Um, is uh, um, you, how you do networking. All right, so the next part of our talk, you notice I'm in a new location. I'm filming this over multiple days. Um, next part is device deployment. Now, there, there are two aspects of this. There are like configuration, management, getting it you know, set up correctly, but then also logistics. How do you get devices, like how do you order them and how do you get them to your end users? Now, the first thing you'll want to figure out is, you know, if you're a um, US only company or a worldwide company, these are kind of two different strategies. Um, uh, or if you're, you know, you're kind of in the same country. And, and I know there are companies that are, that are worldwide uh, but for the sake of our discussion today, we're going to talk about like assuming you're in the same geographical region. Uh, maybe again, you're spread out over hundreds and hundreds of miles, but um, you're you're not crossing oceans. So the first thing you will want to figure out is how do you get the laptops to end users? Now, for the Apple focused enterprise, the the tools you want to use are Apple's Business Manager then Apple's online business portal. And what that allows you to do, um, we'll start with the, uh, the business portal. That allows you to look at device pricing, order it, and then purchase it. Now, you can ship it to your corporate headquarters and then ship it out yourself to the end user if you wanted to, say, put a um, asset tacking track on it. Now, I would argue the better way drop ship it to the end user on the, the purchase screen you can change the address so drop ship it to the end user um, I believe that will um, you really as you scale up you're not going to want to like be having to order laptops and then and ship them directly out um, now on the flip side if you did say order a bulk of them at a time and you just had them say let's say you were remote and you had them in your home office ready to ship out uh, that could be the strategy, but if, if again, if you're as your team scales, if you just want to order um, one at a time, drop ship it to the employees. Um, that that'll definitely work. Now, you'll also need to to pick up an MDM solution, purchase one of those, and then get that connected to your Apple Business uh, Manager account. This is uh, what Apple used to call the Device Enrollment Program, 
And what that will allow you to do um, is as you, again, drop ship laptops straight to employees, they can set it up themselves without you ever having to touch it. Um, now again, you would be missing the asset track, asset tag, but I would argue that um, the serial number is, is way more relevant to that than, than having something on the bottom of it. And in often cases, that can hurt resale value in the future. So uh, when, the, when the end user opens the laptop for the first time and they connect it to their Wi-Fi network, the device will then ping Apple servers, connect to your management system, and begin to enroll, downloading all your policies, and you've never had to touch it. And that's gonna be really a key thing. Again, you may say, oh, we don't need that, we're 10 people. Okay, um, when you're thinking about processes for 10 people, sure, I, I could, I could that, that, I'll give you that. But I always think about when you triple the numbers. How does that work for 30 people? How does that work for 90? And if you've got a handful of people that are fine setting up their own Macs and purchasing Macs, that, that's great. That, that works for you today. What's going to happen when the people that don't, that you know, you hire somebody that's not a technical person, that they you just want their computer, they have a very particular job they have to do, they're not in any sort of tech field. How do you how do you handle that? Uh, and so that's where figuring up device and device deployment is going to be um, is going to be very very important. Next, enabling users to support themselves. So this is going to be something that it is important for a remote workforce because you're not going to always ha have IT support available right there with them. They're going to have to be more aware of how things work, where the pitfalls are, and the first steps of troubleshooting. And again, this could be as simple as um, my Zoom calls are, are laggy and it could be something with their with their home internet. Um, again, just something to you know just something to keep in mind the next thing I want to talk about is enabling users to support themselves now again we've kind of established the fact that people are working remotely they're not going to have IT support this one maybe a few hundred miles of them if they run into a quick issue they're not going to be able to you know call the IT department and someone to run down to help them um, th there are certainly tools like remote access um, and things like that, and those are very, very important. Um, and we'll discuss this later, but I think the, the thing you need to think of first is enabling users to support themselves. So first thing you're gonna to wanna to do there is you're gonna to need to have well-developed help documentation that people use. So you're looking at your core applications, um, decide like what are the key pitfalls that people generally run into with those? What generally goes wrong and, and how do you fix those? And, and they have to start there. Um, then, then past that, uh, again, you're gonna, they're gonna need to know like, okay, if my Zoom calls are laggy, what do, what do I do? Is it, uh, is it a Wi-Fi issue? Do I call my internet service provider? How do you determine that? Uh, and, and that's gonna be different for every organization, um, but you're, you're gonna need to kind of develop this, um, what's the word, this culture of fix it, and I can fix it, or I can learn to troubleshoot these things, and that's gonna be key. Um, is, is helping users begin to support themselves. So again, um, develop really, really robust help documentation and encourage people to, to fix it themselves. And when they can't, you can assume they've done these basic things. And that's when you bring in your remote access tools, uh, help desk, um, and, and, and things like that. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is app installation for remote employees. We've talked about the idea of the, the zero touch deployment where you drop ship a laptop in the shrink wrap to employees and it sets itself up for them. Part of that is the app installation. And you know that can be things that happen at initial install or when you deploy new applications. And that's gonna happen, there are two types of apps, I guess we should say, is there's Mac App Store apps and non-Mac App Store apps. App Store apps, very, very easy. Actually, if they were all in the App Store, we don't even need a, a discussion on this because it's that easy. Um, so Mac App Store apps work by using what used to be called Apple's volume purchase program that's in your Apple school, biz, school or uh, business manager account. And there's a section in there, apps and books. You just buy them. It's connected to your mobile device management solution. You just deploy them automatically. 
uh, it's very, very easy. Uh, you, if you need 500 licenses of an app, you can buy 500 licenses, you hit a couple of buttons and it just starts deploying, uh, or you can set it to auto deploy with, with new device rollouts. Now, non-app store apps are a little trickier, and sadly, the majority of our apps are non-app store apps in the enterprise. So you're thinking of the Zooms, Chrome, thing, things like that. Now, now, Microsoft Office is in the app store, uh, but for a variety of reasons, you may want to deploy the non-app store version of it. It, um, it really just, just depends on you, you know, your organization. Uh, and I, what I wish Apple would do here is to create a library of applications that uh, developers could say, like a Zoom, could submit Zoom to Apple to be included in its enterprise app store that doesn't require any sort of sandboxing, uh, but it would make it easy to deploy and then to update. Uh, it would be fantastic, um, um, but well, you know, maybe one day. Now, the strategy here is to, you need to package your um, uh, files up. Now, depending on your MDM, they may have solutions for this and they may not, and there are tons of solutions to make uh, PKG files from uh, DMG files. So you're gonna wanna take your, your um, download of say a zoom and uh, create an a install, installable file from it and then you'll upload that to your ndm uh, and you know the kicker is you're going to have to keep this updated uh, and, and how often you do that uh, it just depends it depends to me it depends on how good the app is at keeping itself updated an app like chrome is very very good about almost forcing updates uh, and same thing with zoom zoom's gotten very good about keeping updates um uh, then again an app like microsoft office um is good at updating itself and the um and it updates frequently so you may again you know, not want to have to like repackage that file up every week but again you're going to want to take your core applications and then you got to package them up and then again most mdms have a way to uh basically add that pkg file um and have that deploy so again that's that's remote apps installation um you're just going to have to figure out what you need and your your MDM vendor is going to be the one that's going to help you there on, on packaging this up. Now, again, like I said, hopefully one day Apple will make this simpler for everybody. And that's something that uh, MDM vendors can just tie into. Our next topic is remote access tools. Um, now, I'm not going to get, kind of get into a nitty gritty of the best tools. Uh, there, there are tons of them. Logman, Splashtop, uh, there, there are tons out there. Some even are uh, can be built into mobile device management systems. There, again, there are a, a plethora of tools out there. Um, but uh, I, that, that's not a word. Plethora, plethora, that's the word, sorry. I guess the, my point here is this is different on the Mac in terms of how you deploy it. It is going to require some end user uh, work to authenticate the application. And that's not anything you can do ahead of time, which is a frustration to IT administrators everywhere. You really just wish this was, um, you know, taken care of for you. But um, so, th and that goes back to your good help desk documentation, making sure they know how to give this, app, whatever application you choose, give it the, um, ability it needs to, uh, from a security perspective, it, it's going to ask to for accessibility uh, access and uh, likely screen recording access as well. And the reason you need these tools is sometimes you just need to see what the end user sees um, because you can't physically uh, touch the machine. You're going to have to to be able to um, uh, you kind of get a, a window in it. So they're getting a particular error message. If you need to check the activity monitor, if you need to help them clean up malware. Uh, whatever whatever it is, you, you're at times going to need to have remote access to that. So think through that on the front end, though. Uh, and, and so kind of already have your strategy, work through your testing on how you're going to deploy it, what tool you're going to use, and, and educate your users on like, hey, when you see this application is for this, this is what this is for. Um, and so, and the nice thing is, it, it, worst case, if uh, you're having trouble getting connected for remote access the first time, they can't figure out how to add ac accessibility support, there's always FaceTime. And that is kind of the beauty of all the tools we have, worst case, someone can FaceTime you and you can kind of visually walk them through how to get remote access to machines. I've had this happen tons of time to me. It's like, hey, let's just get on the FaceTime. I'll show you what to click. And then you can have remote access to the machine um, as well. Now, I think it's important for end users to know that you're not watching them all the time. That it's only gonna be um, when they ask. And like the tools I like to use uh, require the end users to actually generate a, uh, a PIN code for you to use it. It's a one-time PIN code. So they know that like, hey, unless I generate this code, IT can't see what I'm doing. That's just a privacy thing, uh, particularly in the world when they're in their home, own homes um, with active webcams. Um, so again, that is uh, remote access tools, you know, summary of it. Find, you're gonna need something. So just find it, uh, test it and get it deployed. 
All right, our, our next topic of discussion is operating system updates. And this is obviously timely because Mac OS Big Sur has just been released and probably many organizations are still kind of grappling with um, the deployment of it. And I take the, I think there's kind of two mindsets you can take here. One, delay operating system updates as long as possible because they just create confusion and problems. And number two, you need to install them right away because they have important security fixes. That's, I, I understand both of those and I line up here in the middle. Um, I always tell people that, um, you're going from when you do it in OS update, you're going from the most stable version of one operating system to the least stable version of the next one. And for those in the tech community that like new, they often are fine with that. As I've gotten older, I've become less fine with that. Um, and so this Mac that I'm recording on is still running Mac OS Catalina. I ran Big Sur Beta on another computer all summer long. It's fine. It works great. I just haven't taken the time to put it on this one. And I know that it, things are, it's going to take me a little time. It's going to be a big download. It's going to, I'm going to have to get some setting, reset some settings, and it looks different. And I'm more concerned about getting this recording done than I am installing that update. And that's how a lot of people feel with technology. A lot of your end users. They don't care about Mac OS Big Sur. The, the new features, they don't care. They just need their core applications to work. So you need to keep that in mind, that it, when you're kind of gung-ho about getting these new updates deployed, your end users, it brings frustration and uh, to them. And it, it's possible it can mess something up and think something can be broken that then you have to go back and fix. Um, and it's again, not as easy to, to restore uh, to a previous operating system when you're remote. So, but on the flip side, you can't delay it forever because there are important security fixes that come to that. And eventually, you know, app compatibility becomes an issue. And your, the Apple's MDM spec allows you to delay it up to 90 days where your users don't even see it. Um, I certainly recommend you delay it at least 30. Uh, I like to wait until there's been a couple of uh, bug fix updates that have come out. Uh, that, that way they are, you are kind of getting those you know, initial big bugs that Apple didn't catch during the beta period or just didn't have time to, to fix. Um, but again, this is all controlled through your mobile device management system. And so w when talking about operating system updates, um, I like to make sure that every user has a time machine backup. So again, with your deployment strategy, you, you may tell them to, hey, buy, a, buy this hard drive from Amazon or you ship them the hard drive, uh, let them expensive, just like, hey, you need to keep a local time machine backup. That's always helpful. Um, and then kind of explain to people, hey, this is the new update. We're not going to deploy it for this length of time, and then you'll be able to uh, on your own, and by this date, we will force it uh, and, and kind of work through that strategy. So you have a period of letting the bugs be worked out. You have a period of letting people install it themselves. Uh, again, they need to be sure they have a time machine backup because it's much easier to restore to when you have a time machine backup. And then number three, you'll force it by a certain date. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the rationale uh, I, like, I like to go through. Again, none of it is, um, it, it, it's all tricky. I mean, it, any operating system is tricky, particularly with Mac OS Big Sur, where it looks so different. Uh, it's gonna it just cause questions. So general advice is to proceed with caution, but to know that it is something you, you have to do. You can't just stay on Mac OS, Mac OS Catalina for three years. Like you've eventually got to update. And as you deploy new computers, they will have the new updates. So you're going to have to make sure your apps are compatible um, with that. We've come a long way from the Windows world where you'd stay on Windows 7 for 10 years uh, because your apps weren't compatible. Uh, now you've just got to, you have to kind of make it work. And thankfully, apps, particularly on the Mac, have gotten much better about making sure they work on new updates. So again, operating system by base strategy, uh, especially in a remote world, is something you have to think through and uh, just communicate that to, to your users. All right, the next thing we're going to discuss for IT in a remote world with an Apple uh, organization is device repairs. Uh, now, this can be for a multitude of reasons. It could be... Um, just general, the, you know, the machine breaks. It could be 
the end user accidentally pours uh, Coke on their computer. It could be that a laptop was stolen. Um, and, and so it could be a multiple things. So when I say device repairs, I mean, I'm like kind of encompassing all aspects of something happened to a device. And we need to deal with it quickly uh, because, again, employees can't work without their technology, uh, certainly when they're remote. Now, so let's talk about the first thing in device repairs. So what if what if a machine breaks, whether that be, um, you know, accidental damage or just something physically goes wrong with it and you've diagnosed like I can I cannot help them with this remotely. Um, this is where if you. Or, you know, have, have a relationship with Apple from a business perspective. You can, you know, kind of set up repairs with the local Apple store to to um, work on things. Now, so, again, that's using the Genius Bar. Now, again, you'll need to have documentation for employees on how to set up those appointments so it's convenient to them. There's the Apple Store app. They can do it online. It's very, very easy. Um, and, and, again, so you're not likely to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every Apple Store in the country and to, to facilitate that. They'll employees will need to kind of take that step for themselves, and that goes back to enabling users to support themselves. They'll need to take those in again. The company can you know, pay for any repairs, any damages. Um, they can expense that through their credit card, uh, but the, the, you'll need to define that process. Now, what if they're not in a situation where they're near an Apple store? Um, that's where you'll want to use like a local Best Buy, who is an Apple authorized service center. Uh, you'll want to you know use a company like that. Um, now, if you're in a situation not even that, you're going to need to find an Apple authorized reseller. And if there's not one, you're going to have to take, kind of take secondary steps. Now, that, so that could be if there's a device damage, you're going to have to um, drop ship them a new one, and they're going to send you their current one, and you'll get that repaired, and, and you may even swap that back, or maybe even just that that be a, a loaner uh, for the future. So you'll kind of need to define that process on, on what you do, and you're going to need to kind of research like, okay, where are my employees located? Um, how how quickly are they to an Apple store or a Best Buy? If not, is there an Apple authorized service center? If not, what, what do we do there? Uh, because you're going to need to get them a, a replacement device as soon as possible. Now, uh, what if a device is stolen? Uh, the, the first thing you're going to want to do is um, they're going to want to log in using their um, Apple ID and, and wipe the device. Uh, and again, theoretically, most of your um, corporate resources are um, secured with two-factor authentication anyways, uh, and so they're probably likely on you know, a web interface as well. So you, you, you're going to figure out a way to wipe the device, so either like through the Apple ID or, again, through your MDM solution, you can mark that device as lost, um, but again, just depending on what solutions you have in place. Uh, and then you're going to want to get the employees a, a new device shipped ASAP. That's where even if you do normally um, drop ship devices straight from um, Apple to the employees, you'll want to have a couple spares you know, where you can literally overnight them a new one the next day, um, you know, drop it off FedEx or UBS or whatever your local shipping company is and overnight them a new device. And that's where, again, we're having that time machine local backup is going to be is going to be helpful because it's going to allow them to quickly restore from that uh, while getting that device enrolled in MDM. Uh, but again, you know, just you know, define your policies there and assume those things will happen because they certainly will. They certainly happen to um, in the office employees, so you know they're going to happen to remote employees as well. Uh, and, and just as a side note, one of the things I really believe in is that corporate devices are used by corporate employees. So in your acceptable use policy, employee handbook, whatever you have, um, I would make note that people sign off on the fact that their work computers are for work only and not for kids to do Zoom, schoolwork, uh, things like that, not not for um, spouses to you know use it for research. They are for the end users that are assigned those devices only. Um, and just, it's always been a big thing of mine is uh, these are not for, you know, family to use. So again, it's device repairs and uh, something definitely you need to think through. Okay, next thing to think about, and this is not even necessarily uh, just focused on Apple uh, enterprises. This is uh, really affects all remote organizations, Mac, PC, Linux, whatever you use, employee onboarding. Um, and again, that, that's part of device, you know, device deployment, but it's also just of your understanding your systems and, and how you create um, employees in your in your ecosystem of, of applications. Uh, you know, it used to be where you created someone in Active Directory, and that was all you had to do. They gave them the email, they gave them file sharing, log into the PC. That was that was it. Now it's you've got to create them in HR applications, email file sharing, all the things you have, uh, unless you've unified them. And, and so 
That could be maybe you have a single sign-on provider that you've connected all of your applications to that, that um, uh, then that you create it once and it goes everywhere. It, um, I think in the future, like right now, identity in the enterprise is owned by IT. And I think in the future, that probably will be owned by the human resources departments. I think it'll be up to IT to create the system to where, um, you know, that they created it once and they go everywhere, but where, you know, HR will create the employee in a single sign on application and then IT hands off. It creates the emails, it creates file sharing, it does everything. Um, and then, um, maybe some sort of system there triggers to, you know, to let IT know to deploy the device, but all that really should be happening in the background. Um, and, and so certainly if you're a, a startup or you're, you're new to remote, do start to think through the, like, how can we, how can we simplify this? Like if we're hiring people, how do we make it where it's like not a big deal to hire somebody technically? Can we, you know, instead of, you know, just having emails that you send off to IT, like, Hey, need to get this user created build the systems to let HR create the people. Uh, and then it goes, it goes everywhere from there. Uh, so that's, that's, that's employee onboarding and just something to, you know, uh, think through. And, um, then let's think through employee offboarding as well. Uh, kind of the same, just the reverse process. Like is again, do we change password here and it changes everywhere? What happens to their email address? Um, is it forwarded? Does their, does the supervisor get access? Does HR deal with it? Um, do you download their email logs in case, in case you need it in the future? And so that is just something to think through as employee onboarding and employee offboarding is, is not so much of like what to do, but how do your system scale to remote and how do you keep it to where IT is not involved in every step of that way? Because that's not going to be really their job. I think in the future, um, you're going to build, build and maintain the systems for single sign on. Um, but the identity in the enterprise, uh, which is a very, very key thing going forward, particularly with remote work is going to be owned um, by uh, by HR. And so let's talk about our, our last uh, topic is device offboarding. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up here. Thanks for everybody for, for hanging, uh, hanging with us. Uh, so device offboarding. When it becomes time to redeploy devices, um, you, you know, many organizations that have gone remote first today aren't there yet. Uh, but you know what? We will be shortly because I think I think all this is here to stay remote work wise is is how do you offboard devices and, and, and redeploy them? And a lot depends on what you do with them. Um, now, one of the awesome things about Macs is the ROI on them. Return on investment is fantastic. Like you can buy a Mac today for you know, nine hundred dollars, nine ninety nine, and in three years, it's still worth four hundred bucks. And so, um, you can easily sell those, trade them in, lots of things to do. So, but you have to figure out your process. So, if you're leasing devices from Apple, let's let's just work through leasing. Um, what you'll want to do is you know place the new lease, get that deployed, build your systems, deploy that, and then as the final step of that process, the employee would ship the device back to IT to do whatever they need to do with it. Again, that's you know, trade it in, return it to return it to uh, Apple if, if they're if they're on that kind of lease. But you want to create the system so you say, okay, when you get your new device, put your old device in the existing box and use this return label to ship it back to us or just even say ship it back to the IT department, um, either somebody's house or corporate headquarters so it can be dealt with. But you need to make that as seamless as possible. So again, that's like use the same box, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, you obviously want to wipe that device. Um, and you may even want to do that ahead of time. So you may even work on a policy with the end user to, hey, once your new device is up and running, let us know. We're going to wipe your old one. And so that way, if it kind of goes missing in shipment, um, you're, you don't have to worry, worry about the security of the devices. And so you get that back and then you can, you can do with it, you know, what you want from there. Um, now, maybe you're in type of organization that you say, hey, uh, we're going to be generous. We're going to let you keep your old device. But um, and so you get your new one, we get all your stuff migrated, then you can keep your old one. Use it as a spare. Use, let, let it be a home computer, a kid's computer, whatever. A um, couple things there. Number one, you're going to need to wipe it um, uh, just, just to make sure the you know, corporate data is on there, but also just to make sure that your app licenses aren't being used. So if you've got a license for a certain number of people on these apps, you don't want them being used on multiple computers. Um, and number two, it, again, so just, you know, you, again, you want to wipe it just for security reasons. Number two, I always tell employees that when we give you your new device, if you're keeping your old one and we're giving that to you, 
it is no longer the company device. So you cannot ask questions about it. You cannot open tickets about it. You, it is no longer something that the company is concerned about. Uh, so if you have hardware software issues, you have to go through the normal channels with Apple um, to to get that resolved. And and I know that seems can maybe seem like a jerk to say like, hey, we're no longer working on that computer. Sorry. But what you don't want is a situation to where your IT department is set up to support 100 remote workers, 100 devices, and then you give new devices, and all of a sudden you're supporting 200 devices and devices that were so old that you were replacing them anyways. So, um, again, it, it sounds awful to say, but just think through – you think about how that scales up. And that's what I always tell people. I say – I've had people say, you mean if you have a question about it, you're not going to help me? It's like, well, the, the fair thing is – that when we replace it, it's no longer ours. And I, the analogy I use is like if you you have a company car, and you get a new company car, and the company says well, you can keep the old one just because we're being generous, you don't get to then put the maintenance on the company credit card for that car because it's no longer the company's. They've given it to you; it is now yours. And if you don't want that, you can do what you please with it, but it's no longer the company's to deal with. So. That is device offboarding, um, not something you maybe have to think through today if you're going remote or you're just beginning your remote work journey as an Apple organization, but it's certainly something to uh, begin considering. All right, so we are at the end of this journey together. Uh, so I hope thanks for listening to my talk on supporting end users in a remote work world, uh, particularly looking at it from if you're an Apple organization because that's the world I live in and I know many of you do as well. And uh, I think the thing I would, would leave you with is assume that remote work is going to be um, the majority of your workforce for the foreseeable future. And if it's not, you'll still have policies in place that are built for them to make them feel like first class employees. And, um, uh, you, you know, and again, you just be flexible, be willing to uh, evolve a bit. I mean, this is new to a lot of us. A lot of these policies are you've never had to put these in practice. So. Uh, if you plan for something, try to ask for something, and uh, it doesn't work out, uh, just don't be be willing to change and be willing to fail and be willing to admit it's time to rethink it. So, again, if you have questions, I, I'd love to help as much as I can. Uh, my email is bradley at 9to5mac.com. Um, so if you have any questions on this talk or just uh, in the future need advice, uh, I may mean, not have all the answers, but we can at least strategize together. So, again, thanks for thanks for listening, and have a great day.